Cedemos la palabra al doctor Carlos Elizondo. Pues primero que nada, muchísimas gracias por esta oportunidad de estar hoy con ustedes y con Eric. Yo voy a guiarlo en una conversación durante la siguiente hora. Fundamentalmente hablaré en español porque Eric me ha dicho que entiende el español. Si empieza a sufrir mi español, pues me cambiaré al inglés. Y me da mucho gusto estar además con ustedes, constatando que ustedes arrancaron en el 1917. Si aguantaron la tercera transformación, estoy seguro que podrán con la cuarta. Cuando hablé con Eric para contarle cómo se me ocurría el título y le mencioné que podíamos discutir cómo se ve desde América del Norte la Cuarta Transformación, me dijo, pues, está muy bien, pero ¿qué es eso de la Cuarta Transformación? Es claramente un problema muy local, pero el hecho real es que tenemos un nuevo gobierno y creo que sí es muy importante tratar de situar cómo vemos a este nuevo gobierno o cómo se ve este nuevo gobierno desde Estados Unidos, desde América del Norte. Sobre todo porque cuando el proceso electoral, ¿cuántos de ustedes no preguntaron, pensaron, creyeron que AMLO y Trump se iban a pelear todos los días? Son igualitos, no han sido igualitos. AMLO ha entendido muy bien cuál era la posición razonable desde el punto de vista de un presidente como él, apoyó, impulsó una renegociación rápida del Tratado de Libre Comercio y hasta ahora pues, ha tenido una relación tan cercana que hasta se va a cenar en privado con el yerno del presidente. Entonces, claramente no era lo que nos esperábamos en ese sentido, pero internamente AMLO ha sido un presidente mucho más dinámico, mucho más disruptivo, mucho más amenazante para muchos de lo que quizá nos hubiéramos imaginado. Entonces, con ese contexto, Eric, si te parece, we could start with the questions. Uh, and my first question is, the U.S., of course, sits in the center of the Americas, is trying to address the Venezuelan problem, has to address so many problems in the world. Mexico has usually been a relatively easy partner, uh, some problems here and there, but usually an easy partner. And suddenly this guy comes, who is like the new populist of Latin America, while the rest of the continent is shifting into the right, López Obrador seems to have this left-wing component, including not recognizing the president of the National Assembly of Venezuela. So our first impression in this uh, 120 days from the administration of López Obrador, how is it seen from the council, where you are, of course, worried about strategic problems, the relationship between the different countries, the Venezuela problem. What's your first reaction of the López Obrador administration? Well, Carlos, there's nothing like starting with a very easy question, huh? <laughs> uh, and before I get to that, if I can simply say thank you uh, to AmCham for having me, uh, for the leadership that you clearly show in Mexico and throughout the hemisphere, if I can say. My first trip, actually, or my first meeting with AmCham was back in 1996 when I was working at the White House, and uh, I traveled here several times with senior U.S. government officials, uh, including President Clinton in 1997. And the reason why I'm saying that is because we have known and appreciated the important work of AmCham for many, many years uh, as real leaders in this space. And it is a privilege to have the invitation to speak today uh, to all of you. Uh, you know, after an introduction like that and a question, according to uh, Groucho Marx, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a, a conversation that I myself indeed am looking forward to. But before I get to that uh, specific uh, question, let me bring a little bit of color, a little bit of political framework from Washington if I can. And all of you are very aware, obviously, of the Mueller report uh, that has just been issued uh, in Washington. And you're all very aware, I'm sure, that President Trump has now said that this completely exonerates him. And the fact that Democrats, particularly in Congress, have said, well, perhaps it does in certain ways, but it doesn't in other ways. And my point in raising this is because both sides now think that they're proven correct. And rather than putting these issues to bed, rather than ending them, they're going to amplify them. 
And so I think if we can take away one thing uh, about the Mueller report as of now, today, the campaign for the presidency in 2020 has begun. And the reason why is because with the Mueller report, it really takes the idea, and it already was, but it takes the idea of impeachment off the table uh, in the current circumstances. And so Democrats, in order to change the dynamic in Washington, have to win the election in 2020. They have to win the presidential election. There's a reason for I'm going into this background. It's going to come to your question. It's very interesting, regardless <laughs> of where you arrive to the question. <laughs> but there's a purpose for doing this digression. And in the context of that, it means that everything that is looked at in Washington will be done through the lens, through the eyes of the political, uh, of the presidential election in 2020. Now, this is something that perhaps we always know intellectually, it's always about the elections, but I think this time, more than ever, uh, this is the focus. And so, from the congressional perspective, it means that anything that they agree to do to go forward with will be done in the context of supporting a Democratic candidate for President of the United States. And what President Trump and the administration do will also look forward in terms of his own uh, re-election. And so if you look at uh, what President Trump has been trying to do, he really does see himself as transformational in the U.S. context. He really does see himself as having been elected to protect the forgotten man, the forgotten person to bring a sense of economic security to people who haven't had it before. And as I'm saying these things, it should remind you perhaps of some of the things President Lopez Obrador was also elected to achieve. Clearly, uh, the elections brought to power in Mexico somebody with a different approach to things, somebody with a, a, a sense of the need for transformation in Mexico and a way to do that uh, in terms of reducing corruption and uh, looking for ways to uh, create jobs, reduce income inequality, uh, create opportunity in the south of Mexico. Uh, these are not bad things. These are good things. These are things that the United States, I think, broadly speaking, would, would be very, very supportive of. So if we talk about, you know, United States and Mexico and how do we look at Mexico in the first several uh, weeks of the presidency, you know, people sometimes are surprised when they say, well, President Trump and President Lopez Obrador get along pretty well. But in some ways, they really do. I think they respect each other. I think that they are uh, in some ways similar in terms of the, their, their, um, their leadership styles. They both view themselves, as I understand it, as being transformational for their respective countries. And they both see their missions and their mandate as the same. So, you, you know, in terms of uh, protecting uh, people who have not traditionally had uh, protections of the state, uh, particularly in trade. And so this goes to the heart of what is the nature of the U.S. relationship with Mexico. I mean, we can look at it in the context of, you know, there's this issue that we agree with or that issue that we disagree with or, you know, this type of thing. And we all are going to have our issues. And believe me, I have some that I would wish were going differently. But... There is no divorcing the United States and Mexico. There is no divorcing us. We are neighbors whether we want to be or not. And frankly, I want to be. But, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, many people sometimes have to be reminded of doing. And the idea that we can somehow go forward separately, I think, is just an impossibility. We have to find a way to go forward together in a way that, uh, that benefits both of our people. So now that's a very long-winded way of trying to get to Carlos's very good question because he's asked a very important question. So what, right? What does that mean? Uh, this is a government that's taking a different approach. You have uh, leaders in South America who have been elected uh, perhaps uh, to do a different approach, uh, whether it's Chile or Brazil or Argentina or Colombia, you name it, right? Um, and I think that's very relevant. Um, but in some ways, uh, the elections were for similar reasons. People were looking for change. People were looking to not uh, continue the same road of the past, whether it's on corruption, whether it's on the uh, people, the parties who have um, access to power, shutting other people out. And, and it was sort of a cry of, of populism across the region, not of the Chavez populism, not of the, 
you know, populism of the left, but a populism to say, we need to have our voice heard. Uh, and so, from that perspective, I think the United States is very willing to have a dialogue with Mexico to see, well, how do you want to do this? How do you want to achieve the aspirations of your people? And in some ways, how can we help? The discussion's right now underway about a development fund for southern Mexico and Central America is part of that part of that vision of developing uh, the parts of Mexico and Central America together for our mutual interests. Um, I think that that's, that's an, uh, an example of where ways in we can cooperate and look forward to working together. There are going to be places where we disagree. Carlos has raised Venezuela. I think that is an issue where the United States and Mexico in the current environment are probably going to disagree. Well, they do disagree. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't or shouldn't uh, look for uh, ways to cooperate and collaborate more broadly uh, because I firmly believe that it's in our mutual interest to do so. Thank you. But the fact that, and you are 100% right, the fact that the president of Mexico and the president of the U.S. share this idea that we have to address differently political problems. However, from the U.S. perspective, from Trump, President Trump's perspective, this means building a wall with Mexico, changing the rules of the game of the free trade agreement, trying to make the problem of migrants from Central America, more a problem of Mexico and let, um, le less a problem of the United States. So it imposed certain costs to Mexico. President López Obrador, on the other hand, big difference with other populists, to use this word very quickly, is not against free trade, is not uh, defending some nativist view of the world, Mexicans first or whatever. He has a more class-based uh, discourse uh, more classical left wing than what is probably the norm now in this kind of of presidents and contrary to other left wing governments of cent of, of latin america he's not an anti yankee basically i mean we've never seen in the past lopez obrador quickly solving a political issue blaming the gringos which is also always so politically expedient in Latin America. So he has some issues where, in principle, you should be able to construct a better relationship, relationship with the U.S. But on the other hand, this idea of the U.S. of sending part of the U.S. problems into the outside of their borders has probably obliged or has made López Obrador yield in things we might have not seen in the past. Do you think that Right now, for the U.S., so far, President López Obrador has been a comfortable partner, aside of Venezuela, which I'll return, <laughs> but aside of Venezuela. He seems to have accommodated more some of U.S. demands, perhaps because of le his legitimacy, because he can do things that other presidents were probably politically incapable of doing. He's been quite in a... a a good partner with the U.S. Do you would you agree with that? And what are you, do you think are the implications of this? I think broadly speaking, I would agree with that. I think many people have been surprised at how smooth the relationship has been to this point. Uh, in some ways, it's been smoother than the relationship that the U.S. has had with Canada, uh, which is, uh, you know, you all know your history. That's a little bit of a surprise, um, uh, you know. And the expectations uh, were quite different. Uh, when uh, President López Obrador was elected. Uh, and I think he has taken a strategic uh, approach to the United States, which has benefited uh, Mexico, I believe, but also the United States, um, to not uh, buy into this uh, politically charged rhetoric north of the border, to not respond to every provocation, to, not, uh, to, to recognize that U.S. has politics just like Mexico has politics, uh, and to focus on what his agenda is in Mexico, and to the extent that uh, collaboration with the United States can assist that, I think that it's proven to be the case, um, uh, and where uh, perhaps uh, things are going the other direction, then uh, not to uh, give a whole lot of oxygen to that type of discussion. I think that's been an effective approach. But perhaps Trump, uh, López Obrador's approach is based less on, not only on a strategic vision of the world, of, of his relation with the U.S., but also this view he has not to meddle with 
other people's, other countries' affairs. I mean, he's being, in that sense, very consistent. He certainly didn't support the recognition of Guaido, but he voted with the U.S. Uh, against criticizing Saudi Arabia for likely violations of human rights in because for the same reason, I, we don't meddle in other people's affairs. However, shouldn't be Mexico meddling a little bit more in the U.S. affairs, trying helping that renegotiation of NAFTA go through Congress? When you compare what with the kind of things that the Salinas administration did to enable the Congress to approve NAFTA, they were extremely active, extremely strategic, they started very early in that endeavor. And my feeling is that for NAFTA's reapproval, or whatever you wanted to, to say it, for the approval of NAFTA, López Obrador, shouldn't he be more active in the U.S.? You know, it's an interesting question, and I, I have not heard it quite framed that way before in terms of the issue of intervention and, you know, staying out of other countries' affairs. So let me deal with that first and then come to the, um, the lobby and USMCA question, uh, if I can. Uh, and I think everybody recognizes that uh, President uh, López Obrador has a more traditional approach to international affairs, uh, non-intervention and strict neutrality on these sorts of issues, and I think that makes sense. But I think, uh, from his perspective, but I think from the United States, the United States is never going to be another country for Mexico, in my view. Mexico is still uh, sends over 80% of its exports to the United States, over 80% of imports come from the United States. The supply chains are fully integrated, obviously. You know all these things. Um, you know, 40 cents of every uh, uh, dollar exported from Mexico represents input from the United States. It, by the way, the, the equivalent uh, amount from Canada is 25 cents, and from China, it's 4 cents. So Mexico is 10 times more U.S. content, which is just one example of why it's so critically important for the U.S. economy that Mexico's economy does well. Um, but the idea that um, it's an issue of non-intervention, no, I, I look at it a little bit differently. I look at it in the context of, you know, if the president of Mexico has very ambitious social goals, which require money, require funds, it requires a growing economy. And in order to have a growing economy, I think by definition, Mexico needs to have a healthy economic relationship with the United States. Uh, the USMCA has to go forward so that that relationship continues to be ordered according to rule of law, predictability, all of these things. Uh, and also the US economy has to be growing as well, because when the US economy does well, Mexico also does well and vice versa. And so I think I can't speak for him, I don't try to speak for him, please don't misunderstand, but it, from an outside observer's perspective, it seems logical that what may be happening is that Mexico is trying to maintain a, a positive economic relationship with, with the United States so that, uh, so that Mexico's own domestic ambitions can be met. Now, in that context, I fully believe that passage of USMCA is critical. Um, I, all of the issues you know very, very well, we can go into them if you'd like, but the idea that somehow um, politics is going to intervene and we're not going to have a trade uh, relationship among Canada, the United States, and Mexico, I think is just, um, it's something I don't even want to consider. Um, you know, because the whole idea of NAFTA originally was to build certainty into the North American economy. And frankly, to build the North American economy is a bulwark against growing economies elsewhere, namely China, but also other countries as well. And I think, by and large, it's proven to be a huge success in that regard. And so if you begin to talk about USMCA as something optional or something that we should think about or it's not for certain, uh, then all of a sudden that issue of certainty becomes questioned. And that then goes to the heart of what the business community needs and looks for from an investment relationship. No, is the certainty to invest so that over time they're going to know, uh, they're going to have the ability to determine uh, how those investments will play out. So in that context, I do think it would be useful. I do think it would be important uh, for Mexico, whether the government, uh, certainly the private sector, uh, and others to be, to, to be an active presence in um, in Washington, uh, promoting this agenda. Clearly, that was part of the original NAFTA. Uh, clearly, uh, it made a very positive benefit. And one of the things that, if I can be a little bit self-critical as a member of the business community, we have not done very well, is that after NAFTA was passed originally, 
They all said, okay, very nice. NAFTA was passed, right? And now we go on to something else, and we worry about China, you know, PNTR, PNTR, PNTR or you know, WTO, or a trade agreement with Colombia, or TPP, or something like this. But the opponents of NAFTA never left the field. They never left the field. They kept lobbying Congress. They kept writing the press releases. They kept saying NAFTA is terrible and all these things. And the business community went on to something else. So there's a lot of grounds that has to be made up to just basically educate people. Why is Mexico an opportunity for the United States, not a threat? Why is Mexico a strategic partner for the United States, not something that we can say somehow, well, we'll think about agreeing you know, at some point? This is urgent for the United States, and I think the Mexican uh, government and private sector have a huge role to play in that to show the reality on the ground for Mexico. And under the current political conditions, how likely do you think it is that the U.S. Congress will approve at some moment uh, the USMCA pact. Well, remember, go back to how I opened this conversation, and I did so intentionally, that everything is now being, is going to be looked at through the politics of 2020. Um, and it seems to me that if uh, this can be done in a way that the parties will consider it to be helpful for them politically, I think they'll find a way to get it done. Do you think that Democrats will find this helpful for their re election aspirations? I think that they may. How? Uh, well, I, I'm glad you asked that question because I, um, the reason why is because if you're a candidate for president from the Democratic Party, you want to be elected, obviously you want to be elected, but you want to be elected with this issue taken care of. You want it off the table, you don't want to have to deal with it, you don't want to have to go against your own base, the labor unions, etc. Uh, and you want a healthy economy, you want a secure environment with Mexico taken care of, and you want this done, right, kind of off the plate. And so from a political perspective, and it's just politics at this point, um, if the party can get to the, uh, to, get to the point Thank you. Where they can be convinced that having it done by the time the, the presidential primaries really begin in earnest a year from now, then you have a window, don't you? You have a window where this can be brought up in the U.S. Congress uh, by the end of the year. Now, the most optimistic scenario would have it go through uh, by the end of June. Uh, by the time, you know, the Canadian Parliament rises uh, after, at the end of June, they have their own uh, elections in October, etc. And if you miss that window, it's going to be difficult, then that pushes you into November, December. But I think, I'm trying to be optimistic, I think that is a realistic scenario if it happens. You're trying because you're not so optimistic? Well, you know, this is a game uh, for optimists. Uh, we have to, you know, we have to push forward and do what we can to, to make it happen. Everybody can come up with reasons why it's not going to happen. I mean, I can give you a list uh, of... But I would like to see, like, your, your more complex view. The, the, the common knowledge is that Democrats won't give right. Trump this victory. Why do you think they should be thinking once they win the presidency inst instead of, as politics usually is, the short run, let's make this deal miserable to President Trump. That's a very fair question, and I think that the answer is uh, they don't want to give President Trump a victory. Uh, but I think that's why we need to try to recast it. It's n you're not giving the White House a victory, you're giving the United States a victory, and you're giving your future presidential, uh, your future president a victory. And if you can put it in those terms, then perhaps you can change enough minds. Now, for f in case things get stalled in Congress, do you think that President Trump could use the nuclear power, which is a withdrew of NAFTA, will be responsible for whatever things, whatever things happen because you don't approve the new NAFTA? You certainly can make that case, um, and I cannot speak for the administration. Uh, I'm not going to try to. Um, uh, we're, in the, we're in the world of speculation here, of course. Uh, but having said that, it is an option, and he has indicated verbally uh, clearly his, his uh, desire to do that. Um, is this a negotiation tactic, or is it real? Well, I don't know. Um, clearly, it's a tactic in, at one level to put pressure on Congress to move forward. Uh, with the agreement, um, and you know, if Congress does not do so in a manner that the president finds timely, it's some people would argue that he would pull out of NAFTA and put pressure on it, uh, you know, to essentially force Congress to take action. But I think you have to remember, you have to remember. Look, this whole scenario was just tried. 
at the end of the year in terms of the U.S. budget, and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer said, okay, Mr. President, it's on you. And the government shut down for the longest period of time in history. And so you can make a counterpoint scenario here, and again, this is pure speculation, ladies and gentlemen. I have no, you know, I'm not speaking for either political party here, but if we're playing this out, uh, history would tell us that one option may be for the Democrats to say, Mr. President, if that's what you want to do, it's on you. And if you have the business community screaming and the border states screaming and you have job loss right before an election, if that's what you want to do, that's what you go for it. Um, and so I think people are going to have to think this through because this, this game of chicken uh, really has real world consequences and it really affects uh, people. And in the meantime, the fact that we're even having this conversation, you know, everybody that's looking for the North American space from an investment opportunity, we're all thinking, well, okay, uncertainty, right? We're going to withhold until we actually see what, what happens. And that's bad for everybody. I hate these type of questions, because <laughs> the one I'm going to make right now, because they are very tricky. But just to have some idea, you were obliged to put some numbers. What's the percentage of probability <laughs> that USMCA will be approved, the percentage that Trump will withdraw, and the percentage that will just continue business as usual, just to give some parameter? I hate these questions, but now I ask the question, so it's easier. Well, I don't know. Do you want me to still have a job tomorrow, or do you want me to, uh, you know? Are you trying to get me fired? Um, I, I, will, I will answer that, uh, perhaps obliquely, but I will answer it. But I think a couple things have to happen first. Before we even get to that point, uh, we've already talked in this conference earlier today about the labor reforms that Mexico's going through. Uh, we've also talked about 232. Uh, that's come up several times. Um, we don't know if Mexico and Canada will refuse to go forward on their own perspective if 232 is not lifted by, uh, on, on steel and aluminum, if not, is not lifted by then. But I can tell you that if they have not gone forward, then the U.S. Congress will find it difficult for them to go forward as well. So everything is, is sequenced. But let's assume that Mexico approves the labor reform. Uh, well, okay, that if you want to assume that everything is cleared out, um, I think, uh, you know, because of the importance for the United States. Remember, I worked in a Democratic White House, okay? So you can have your own views and you can strongly disagree with me if you like, but if this is at the end of the day put before Congress by the Democratic Speaker of the House and she asks her caucus to vote in favor of it, I think you can get to 218 votes. I do. The question is gonna be what will it take to cause her to put to bring it to a vote and I think I think that's the pure politics that we've been talking about that's a good description but I still don't have my number <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think uh, I, I think uh, you have to assume that um, I, I actually don't want to say because I know we're at the open press and this is what's going to come back and kill me but I think uh, I, I, th I think you do have to recognize that it's not a done deal by any stretch and we have to assume that the obstacles to passage are very high and that we all have to work together to make it pass. And how costly you, do you think is vis-a-vis -vis certain senators in Florida the fact that Mexico has maintained this policy with Venezuela? Is that material in terms of the negotiation of NAFTA? It's a very important question. The short answer is at this point, no. Um, but circumstances are very fluid in Venezuela. Uh, we just saw Russian uh, troops uh, enter the country and people say that they're for maintaining equipment and things, etc. cetera, but um, this is not helping things. Uh, I can tell you that the White House is, is noticing um, and the rhetoric is uh, increasing very high. Um, you know, Venezuela is a failing state uh, where um, uh, its government is responsible for destroying a very wealthy country. Um, the United States has moved forward with sanctions, but the sanctions have not caused Venezuela's economic collapse. And I will uh, happily go into that discussion in more detail to the extent anybody cares to. But having said that, uh, it's also been noticed that uh, there is one obvious um, one obvious anomaly in the Latin America consensus about Venezuela, whether it's in the Lima Group or in other institutions, that's clearly Mexico. Um, but to this point, it's not, um, it's not been linked to the trade agenda or to the border agenda. And I, I don't think it will be ultimately. I hope that it isn't. These are two separate issues. I think we should, we should continue to keep them separate. And this fund, this development fund for Central and South, Me South Mexico and Central America of eight billions, for me, it's a little bit, uh, I, I really understand how it works. I, I, is this real money 
that will come from the U.S. taxpayer to fund what in Central America and Southern Mexico is more like you know, trying to help private sector to invest in Central America and South, Southern Mexico, if the conditions are proper, which of the two is? Yeah, a lot of it's a combination. Lo no, it's a combination, but it's primarily loan guarantees from the over uh, loan guarantees, no guarantees. Uh, overseas private investment corporation incentives to try to mobilize private sector investment uh, in the region. Um, you know, this is real money that they're talking about—ten billion dollars U.S. That's you know, that's a lot of money. Um, you do have a real question about absorptive capacity in Central America. Um, you know, can the region absorb that amount of money? Uh, in economies that are relatively small uh, and underdeveloped, there are projects that need to be done, but there aren't project ready uh, or, or, or you know uh, projects that are ready to be uh, moving forward. Everybody talks about infrastructure, but okay, what specific project do you want to invest in? What specific um, you know issue do you want to address? And is the project ready for an investor to actually come in and 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 not just uh, look at, but put real money behind? And I think that's one of the things that has to be done. Is we have to think more clearly about what specifically it is that that money is going to go to. And what are the th kind of things that could happen in Mexico in terms of the policies that López Obrador has promised in his, during his campaign that could make the relationship d with the U.S. more complicated? What are the kind of things that could derail this relatively so far good relationship between the two countries? Well, I think uh, clearly a, a, an amplifi amplification of rhetoric uh, could uh, could cause some some damage, um, but you know the the United States looks at these issues through a domestic policy lens, and so uh, issues like immigration, issues like uh, drug trafficking and security, um, you know the security agenda. These are very important issues for the United States. Um, I mean the whole issue of the wall, which you know is so politically potent, is. Uh, you know, it's obviously an oversimplification of the issue, but the uh, whole idea is build a wall, you don't have to deal with these issues. Now, everybody in this room knows that, you know, it's more complicated than that, but it's a political winner. So if you're, at least in some elements of, of the United States, so if you're looking for ways to complicate the relationship, I mean, start, uh, you know, picking at some of those domestic issues um, that are seen that way from the United States perspective. But again, I don't see that that's the direction that we're heading. Um, I don't see why um, that would be the case. I mean, there's enough complicated agenda before us right now to deal with, and I don't think we have to go looking for other things to try to divide us. One of the th topics that in the past have made the relationship with, with the U.S. complicated is, of course, drug trafficking. One of the good news, perhaps, is that heroin is being substituted by some chemicals that come from China, yes. so that should diminish the tension between the two countries. Marijuana has been legalized in most states in the United States, so if Mexico were to legalize that, would that be a problem if Mexico, just like Canada did, were to legalize uh, marijuana, would that be a problem with the U.S.? It's really hard to say. It's a fair question. Uh, it's really hard to say. I mean, marijuana, uh, recreational use remains illegal at the federal level uh, in the United States, but uh, as various states have been legalizing it, as you know, um, not just for medical use, but uh, for personal consumption as well. Um, I think it's time for a dialogue uh, in North America on these issues. Uh, Canada, as you referenced, has clearly gone a different direction. Um, and, you know, the drug policy that the U.S. has had for many years is, is a product of a different time, perhaps, in a different uh, environment. And, um, you know, the issues have moved forward in a certain way, and I think we have to have a more comprehensive approach. Um, it's difficult to t ask one of our neighbors and partners and friends to do something that we ourselves are not willing to do and then punish them when they don't do it. And I think that's, at bottom, what is, uh, what is a challenge here. Having said that, um, y you know, the United States itself hasn't fully um, moved toward legalization, obviously, um, and so this is a complication and will continue to be. But Canada has just legalized. Canada has. Really. That's right. Has, had, has that had an implication with... Broadly speaking, it has not had a dramatic shift in, in policy. 
Um, it, uh, it's been something that maybe it's because of the news cycle, maybe because there's so much else going on that just has not captured headlines in the way that it might have in previous years. Now, while Lopsora has been low-key and certainly forging a very productive partnership with the U.S., in Brazil we have a completely different kind of president. He wants to be the Brazilian Trump. He wants to have, for the first time probably in the recent history of Brazil, there's a president that admires the U.S. and wants to be like the U.S. Two questions. How do you think that's going to... To, 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 to evolve, because there, there are like structural complexities in that relationship that has made it very difficult for the Brazilian economy to open, to the Brazilian uh, political class to accept, let's say, a different relation with the United States. And for the US, Brazil is never so important as to invest a lot of co political capital for changing things, A. Do you think this time is different? And secondly, will that have an implication in the relationship between Trump, President Trump and President López Obrador? It's a really fascinating question. You know, President Bolsonaro from Brazil was just in Washington uh, last week. Last week, yes. Yeah. And um, this was a, a meeting between a U.S. and Brazilian president unlike anything we've ever seen before. I mean, I was in the Clinton White House, as I mentioned, and the relationship that Bill Clinton had, President Clinton had with uh, Cardoso was very warm, very uh, close. Uh, George Bush and uh, Lula da Silva were different politically, obviously, but they had a very good relationship. Obama and Dilma was not so warm, but it, it was okay. It was difficult to be warm with Dilma. Well, <laughs> 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 but, but this, this relationship between President Trump and Bolsonaro is not just warm, but it's almost like a mind meld, right? Uh, it's like a, a very similar not just two leaders who uh, view themselves, maybe their countries, able to do things together, but who really have a similar world outlook, uh, it seems. Um, and so there was a lot of mutual political um, connection there, not uh, just the bilateral agenda that one might expect. Um, I think this was a surprise to many Brazilians, certainly for those of us who have watched uh, the relationship for many years. Uh, as I said, it's something unlike we've ever seen before. But I can clearly say that from the U.S. perspective, from Washington's perspective, uh, many people see this as an opportunity uh, to move forward with Brazil to address some of these very uh, challenging problems we've had for many years, trade being the first one, uh, tax policy, uh, clearly, um, and then uh, moving forward with uh, things like uh, military cooperation in space, uh, space launch cooperation, things like that. Uh, and what has brought, I think, the two presidents closely together is not just their worldview, but also, for example, Brazil's willingness, and here it goes back to your question or from earlier, Brazil's willingness to engage meaningfully on Venezuela which is something that Brazil would never have done before. In fact, in previous presidencies, Brazil uh, was a counterpart, a counterpoint to the United States on Venezuela, and now is, a, is an ally and, and partner in some ways. Still not, you know, going to any sort of military, anything like that. But, you know, the idea that Brazil uh, now sees Venezuela as a challenge and not, uh, you know, they don't support uh, Maduro, I think is a real shift, and that's uh, something that the United States has taken note of. There's one issue that has to be mentioned, however, in the Brazil-U.S. context, which is also facing Mexico, I believe, and that's the issue of China. Um, the United States in the Western Hemisphere is looking at any number of issues, uh, Venezuela we've talked about, but very much looking at the implications of uh, aggressive Chinese entry into the Western Hemisphere over the last 15 years or 20 years, more 15 years, I guess, is more accurate. Um, and what are the implications? What does that mean? What's the Chinese way of doing business? What is their strategic goal? These sorts of things. And in every meeting at the bilateral level, um, as I understand it, uh, China comes up. Now, the United States takes a more skeptical view of, of uh, Chinese uh, activities in the Western Hemisphere. All we have to do is look at the speeches of uh, secretaries of state, from Rex Tillerson when he was secretary to Mike Pompeo and others. So it's a very public position. Um, and, you know, clearly China came up in the context of the visit of President Bolsonaro, but Brazil has a different scenario with China, don't they? I mean, Brazil, China is Brazil's top trade partner, um, is a major investor in the country, and Brazil is one of the BRICs. And so there is clearly a relationship there that 
is not so easily defined as, you know, against the United States or in the U.S. context. It's a pre-existing uh, bilateral relationship on its own. So this idea that Brazil then is going to uh, all of a sudden get concerned about China and, and change its approach, I think, is something that um, we have to uh, probably take with a little bit of a grain of salt because, you know, as their... As their um, economy minister said and others said in Washington when they were there, uh, you know, look, we would prefer to trade with the United States and, and have investment from the United States, but if you don't show up, we have to trade with whoever will, you know, and we'll trade with China. You've traded with China for many years. Why can't we? So this is an area where I think uh, there will be further discussions going forward. Yeah, and Brazil and the U.S. compete in the agricultural yep, products absolutely. in a way that is very complex because a free trade between Brazil and any of the major developed countries in agricultural products doesn't exist because they're extremely competitive without subsidies. So that makes any of these trades complicated. That's exactly right. That's a good point. Now, let me ask you a very easy question. I know it's a very obnoxious question, in fact. <laughs> Mexican, many Mexicans are worried about Lopez Obrador becoming a Chavez. One of the things I think that makes it a big difference between Chavez and López Obrador, among many others, is, of course, the border with the U.S., the proximity of the U.S. with, with, with Mexico. Many, are still, many Mexicans might not yet understand why the U.S. allowed the Cubans, the Chinese, and the Russians to enter so much into the Venezuelan uh, political life and, in a way, sustain the Chavez-Maduro regime, what would happen in a very far-fetched scenario if López Obrador started to bring Cuban security advisors to Mexico and start making strategic deals with Russia, et cetera, et cetera? What would be the reaction of the U.S.? Well, it wouldn't be favorable. Uh, it, it would not be welcoming. Um, I think you would find uh, a certain pushback from Washington. Um, you know, the question being, why are you doing this? What's the benefit? Um, what are you hoping to achieve? Um, because, I, I, you know, I think that the United States relationship with Mexico has developed so deeply and so fully and so comprehensively at this point that uh, why would you want Cuban advisors running around? I don't understand what, what that would do for anybody. Um, the idea that maybe China comes and invests a little bit more, okay, you know, in the energy sector or whatever, um, you know, if it's open and transparent investments, that one, that's one thing. Um, but, you know, I think this would be a, a challenge. Um, but, you know, having said that, I think there are also some realities that have changed between now and the last time that something like this was a possibility. For example, you know, during the Cold War, and, and look, the United States and Mexico clearly had different foreign policies during the Cold War, different uh, approach to Cuba, different approach to the Soviet Union, these sorts of things. Um, and we worked through those times, and, uh, you know, we all got to NAFTA. But what's changed is the economy globally. It used to be, you know, before NAFTA and during the Cold War, you know, there was open trade sort of between the United States and the Western democracies and things like this. But now it's globally open trade. And, and if you want to chill... Uh, the interest of the international investor economy in your country, in any country, any emerging market, um, you know, doing some of these things, I think, is going to cause a real challenge for, you know, inflows of direct foreign investment. And as we've discussed, this is something that I believe Mexico continues to need to, to build growth and to build the jobs and to build the economic uh, scenario that the president clearly wants. And so the difference now between now and what used to be is there are other options. There are other places for people to invest. And so I think the global economy can be a bit of a break on some of that. Uh, so, some of that. And I don't see it going that direction anyway. Um, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, putting out that potential scenario. Yeah, I, I think so. But, but still, and the other thing I would mention uh, very quickly is, um, you know, Mexico's own economic management uh, over the years has been very, very good. Um, you know, professionals, technocrats, uh, central bank presidents and things like this, um, people who know what they're doing. And, um, and I think that, that becomes a bit of a, um, uh, you know, a, a boundary uh, as well for what, uh, what uh, any president of, uh, of Mexico or an emerging market might, uh, might try to do. But these are, these are things to, to watch for sure. One final question, because time is running out very quickly. 
Uh, would you, if Lopez Salvador were to phone you tonight, because he's very eager about one question, which is, shall I go and visit the United States soon? <laughs> what kind of visit should I, shall I do? What would be your answer? <laughs> if, he, if he calls me, he's going to say, why did you say all those things about Mexico? And, uh, you know, should have asked me for first. But no, I, you know, uh, this is a challenging question. I hope if he does come to the United States, it'll be not just to AmCham, but also to the Council of the Americas. We'd love to host him. Um, but the idea that, um, uh, I, I, let me put it differently. I believe that our mutual interests are reinforced when our people know each other better. Um, presidential visits uh, are very important in the context of driving bureaucracies to move forward an agenda, um, to getting press attention, to showing um, a face of a country in a very positive way. Uh, look what just happened with the president of Brazil. Um, and so there was a lot of uh, attention on that particular visit. Um, you know, there's an easy way to, to square that circle. Let's go to New York for the UN General Assembly, for example. Um, and, you know, those types of things are, are always options. Um, but, you know, Mexico has such a rich history of, uh, of partnership with the United States. Um, I, my, my only bit of actual suggestion would be it's not just Washington and New York, you know, we have a big country, mm -hmm. lots of interests there, lots of investors on the West Coast, lots of agriculture interests in the Midwest, lots of energy, uh, you know, and these, these areas are ripe for partnership within North America um, and uh, can, be, uh, can be explored, I think, equally well uh, as, as trips to other places. But I, you know, I, I hope that he does at some point. Obviously, it's up to him and his advisors. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they, uh, how they come out. Well, Eric, this has been, for me, a fantastic chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and a joy to be with all of you. Thank you very much.